You are making the world a better place by listening to the Joy of Living podcast. This is your guide to achieving a more purposeful, powerful, and positive life. Join Barry Shore in unlocking the best version of you and becoming happier, healthier, and wealthier. And now, here's your ambassador of joy, Barry Shore. Good day, beautiful, bountiful, being loving, immortal beings, and good looking people. Maybe you're good looking because you're always looking for and finding the good. That's why you tuned in consciously and conscientiously to the joy of living with your humble host, Barry Shore. And you know, you tuned in for one reason and one reason only. It's the best reason in the entire world because you care the most in the entire world about you. Why OU, which is great, by the way, because when you become the best you, you make the world a better place. You build more bridges of harmony. You create more joy, happiness, peace, and love in the world. That's why you tuned into the joy of living. And in this particular episode, we have one of our, <laughs> our great guests who is honoring us with coming back several times in the course of the year. We call it NOTE, N-O-T-E. It's called Nolan on the Economy. And it is um, it is our most popular show. We get so many, I mean, thousands and thousands of emails about, who is this guy? This is amazing. This is great stuff. I'm learning so much. And it's, it's just really important to have the perspective of someone who is there in deep in the economy with his own money, investors' money, and not just theoretical stuff. I mean, real day-to-day, week-to-week situations of owning businesses, running businesses in the United States of America. And of course, what happens in America affects the entire world. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that today. And again, you tuned in and I'm really honored and humbled to tell you that you are joined at this very moment by 348,016 613 people around the world, around the world, all people tune in every single week to listen because you know in this show, you get stuff that's good for you. You're going to learn the three fundamentals of life and use these fundamentals. You'll be happier, healthier, and wealthier. Who doesn't want that? So we're just going to jump in and talk about the three fundamentals and then about why it makes you happier, healthier, and wealthier, and then bring on Peter and really just get right into it. So the three fundamentals, of course, are number one, life, your life has purpose. And when you lead a purpose-driven life, number two happens. Now, in this case, a good number two, you go MAD. Now, MAD is a wonderful acronym that stands for make a difference. You lead a purpose-driven life, you make a difference in the world. And the third fundamental is to unlock the power and the secrets of everyday words and terms. Simple example, right now, the show is carried over the internet, and thank God, hundreds of thousands of people are listening and will be listening. And I urge everybody the time, share this with five people, just that five people, not a hundred. You want to do a hundred up to you, five people. That way we'll touch over a million and a half people and keep going out there with good, useful, actionable information and insights. So just do that and you help a lot of people. It'll be wonderful. And by doing that, of course, by sharing, you become happier, healthy, and wealthier. So www, ask anybody what it stands for, and they'll tell you how to do the internet. Factually speaking, they're correct. But in our world, the world of the positive, purposeful, powerful, and pleasant, WWW stands for what a wonderful world. (laughs) And whenever you hear the opening bars of that great song, What a Wonderful World, which Louis Armstrong made famous, Satchmo touched not just tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but billions of people around the planet. We ever hear the opening bars, you do what do you do right away? You smile. You can't help it. Now, smile is one of the greatest words you can even internalize, utilize, and leverage in your life because smile stands for seeing miracles in life every day. Seeing miracles in life every day. Now, I tell the story about Barry Shore when I'm doing uh, in-person events. I just did one. We have 1,176 people in the audience, no masks, a lot of hugging, upbeat energy, great transformational things were happening and telling the story about Barry Shore and, and tell you about seeing miracles and people raise their hands and say, Hey, Barry Shore, Barry Shore. I've been up for hours where I've seen any miracles. And I asked them, are you here? Can you hear? Can you stand still? I can't do that. Can you walk? I can barely do that. 
Do you have water to drink, your food to eat, your place to stay, your family, your friends? Every single one of those is a miracle. What's the proof? Simplest proof. A million people didn't get out of bed this morning. You know why? They died. By definition, if you're watching or you're listening, you didn't. You have an obligation to live life to the full. So let's just take a look at something. And I got to tell you a quick story, though. Uh, imagine, if you can, standing up in the morning, hale and hearty, able to leave tall buildings in a single bound, and that evening being in the hospital totally, completely paralyzed. That's me. I became a quadriplegic overnight from a rare disease, not an automobile accident, not a spinal injury, 144 days in hospital, two years in a hospital bed in my own home. I couldn't turn over by myself. I was four years in a wheelchair. I had braces on both my legs, my hips to my ankles. That was progress. Thank God today I am vertical and ambulatory with the help of a seven-foot walking wand. So I'm a tripod, not a biped, but I still can't walk up a stair by myself. I can't walk up a curb by myself. And I've helped 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But you hear my voice. Positive, purposeful, powerful, and pleasant, all because of this one word. Smile. Seeing miracles in life every day. But <laughs> funny, my my niece, though, my eight-year-old niece comes over to me a few weeks ago. And she says, Uncle Barry, Uncle Barry, can we spell smile? S-M-I-E-L. I thought about it. I said, smile. sounds the same. Why not? I asked her, how come? She says, because then it would stand for seeing miracles in everyday life. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes, an eight-year-old. What was she doing? She was creating the kind of world she wants to live in. Now, CREATE is a wonderful acronym that stands for causing rethinking, enabling all to excel. Rethinking is critical. It's what I call O-SHIFT. You need to shift your perspective. It's the title of my new book, O-SHIFT. And I got to tell you, in four decades of working with people, 97.2% of people, when I first work with them, they drop the F and shift, and the other stuff happens. You got to be F and careful with your Fs. So, O shift, uh, the ability to shift your perspective and have new ways of looking and thinking about things. And then you'll be able to internalize the six most important words that you'll ever learn. And they are choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Choice not chance determines your destiny. So before we bring on Peter, I want to urge everybody to use the two most powerful words in the English language three times a day from now and the rest of your life, because it will help you, your family, your friends, and all living beings. And these two words are, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks stands for to harmonize and network kindness, to harmonize and network kindness. The Dalai Lama is quoted in saying, I read in his writings, be kind whenever possible. He says, always possible. So imagine you go in the coffee shop, you order a fancy latte, you sit down, somebody brings it to you, say thank you. Go to the coffee shop, order a fancy latte, you sit down, for minutes go by, nobody brings it. So you go to the counter, and they say, I'm sorry, we forgot, we're busy. You sit down, a couple more minutes go by, somebody brings it, you still say thank you. You're walking out of the coffee shop, and it's raining out. Somebody holds the door open for you, you say thank you. You're walking out of the coffee shop, it's raining, and somebody slams the door on you. You say thank you. You're in traffic, you're late for an appointment, somebody cuts you off. You say, thank you. Get up in the middle of the night, you stub your toe and it hurts. You say, thank you. To harmonize and network kindness. I can't think of anybody that is more kind and giving of his time and his insights than our own beloved Peter Nolan. Peter, kind hey. Can you hear inspiring me? noble deeds. Say hello to 368,000 people around the world. <laughs> can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Great, great. Okay, that was a hello, that was everyone. A, Ah, that's a Peter Nolan hello. If you get that, you're already in a high level. So we're going to discuss, as we do on note, note stands for uh, Nolan on the economy. And by the way, everything you want to know about Peter and the stuff that we're going to be discussing, just go to my website, www.whatawonderfulworld.barryshore.com, B-A-R-R-Y-S-H-O-R-E.com. Just lean in. Just listen. You can go back and watch it again or what, go to the notes. But right now, just, just listen and feel what's going on. We're going to talk about what I call RIDE, R-I-D-E, or you can use the same letters and call it DIRE. D-I-R-E, which is about the recession, inflation, debt, and expectations. Uh, but I want to talk about something that's germane in the, in the news around the world these days, and that is the implosion of uh, FTX and crypto. So let's just start off on a high note with something bizarre. So Peter, what FTX, crypto, what's going on? 
Well, I, I, as I've said before, I don't fully uh, understand crypto. Um, you know, I've always been very skeptical of it because essentially some person, you're not exactly sure who uh, created an algorithm and decided that was a global currency. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, enough people bought into it. You know, Jamie Dimon did... Uh, CEO JP Morgan Chase calls it Pet Rocks. And for those of you that are that are probably too young, Pet Rocks is, I don't know, Barry, was that in the 60s or 70s? I think it was I think 70s. it was late, yeah, late 60s, early 70s. Was a fad where people were buying this, you know, rock, small they rock, were buying it <laughs> right in a box and calling it their pet. Uh, and it was it was nothing more than a uh, you know brilliant marketing plan. Uh, to sell something that's essentially worth very little to uh, to people as as a novelty item, and um, what's happened with crypto, you know, is uh, uh, you had uh, you know FTX uh, uh, basically FTX think of them as a bank, and they are they were supposed to be a place where you could keep your your Bitcoin and other uh, uh, basically, uh, digital uh, currency safe, and what they were doing is is that they were uh, lending it out and funneling it out to various other purposes. So they took people's accounts, and they had a sister company called Alameda uh, Trading, a uh, research, I think, and they basically lent that money to Alameda, and Alameda traded it and lost money, and so the whole thing came collapsing. Now the thing the thing that fascinates me is and I don't know the exact answer to this question but a a a material amount of bitcoin and other cryptocurrency is used by bad guys right you know it's used by if if you have for example you know cyber terrorism and you're going to pay ransom you pay it in bitcoin or some other when I say Bitcoin, it could be any other cryptocurrency. Uh, so you know, it could be it could be uh, ransom money, it could be extortion money. The way that people get paid, uh, or if they have drug money, let's say, um, there's a there's an interesting book about the guy who invented the Silk Road website, which was a website where you could buy illegal drugs. You could actually pay to have someone murdered. Um, and, um, uh, I think the book's called the Silk Road. I, I read it a couple months ago, but, but it, it talks extensively about how all that commerce, illegal commerce was conducted in Bitcoin. And oh. so if you think about it and I don't know what percentage, but, but let's say 20% of the, of the, the cryptocurrency on deposit at FTX was for, uh, drug deals or terrorism or extortion or, 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 you know, whatever it is. One thing I've learned is you don't want to lose those people's money. <laughs> well, anyway, by the way, if you have the opportunity to be watching this right now and not just listening, uh, the expression on Peter's face is classic. My expression is naivete. His expression is, um, <clears throat> yes, we, those, you don't want to lose those people's money. I love it. Well, especially if you're going to end up going to jail, for example. Right. Right. You know, because it, it looks like uh, uh, Sam Bankman Fried, the, the fellow who uh, was the architect of, of, of the whole thing, you know, there's, there's a decent chance he ends up in, incarcerated. And if you're incarcerated and, and you lost some bad guy's money, Maybe that bad guy may have friends in jail. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't really know the full impact of, of the collapse of FTX and the, and the ripple effect on other cryptocurrencies, but certainly there's been value destruction as a result of it. Now, you could argue that maybe the value that was there in the first place was a bit illusory, but but people don't look at it that way. I mean, you know, you can see, you know, I, I can go, I have a Bloomberg and you can see exactly where Bitcoin's trading in theory today. And you can convert your Bitcoin into dollars. 
Um, but you know, there's there's certainly a percentage of people out there in the world that you did not want to lose their money. Uh, this is a wondrous insight uh, into the human experience, as well as, like you just said, beautifully value destruction of money uh, on a house of cards, because essentially that's what it was. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for just the fact that the people who were running it were incompetent, which is showing now that they were, but there was no way that it could have continued uh, like a bank. You mentioned Jamie Dimon. <laughs> this is not J.P. Morgan Chase. This thing was bound to spin out of control at some point because it was built on a uh, in sand or a house of cards or, as you say, a, a pet rock phenomenon. It wasn't something that was built around a stable currency that was going to be used for real commerce. Is that fair to right, say? Right, right. You know, I mean, if you look at the history of currency, it was in the United States at least, you know, uh, paper currency was used to because it was all backed by gold, right? It was convertible into gold, and and that was eliminated a, a number of years ago. Um, I think it was by Nixon, Richard. Yeah, Nixon. Which, is, which is sort of oxymoronic, right? You know, a Republican president, but right, right. You know, well, Nixon also had a wage and price controls. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think he had uh, wage and price controls back in the day. I seem to remember them. And um, and so, you know, but you do have I've always said that if you look at if you look at well, people say, well, then paper money, you know, what's it what's its fundamental value? It used to be, well, its fundamental value was convertible into gold and gold is a precious metal and it has or, or a silver. The all the bills were silver certificates. Right, right, right. And so but but now it's what's happened is our currency is backed by the government. And and though governments can inflate currencies and deflate currencies, which has happened, and that's one of the reasons we've seen inflation. But governments also can confiscate, right? The government can say to Barry, Barry, you have uh, this much money in your account, or you make this much money a year, and you're gonna, we're going to take more of it to uh, back our currency um, and to, to run the government. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, governments have taxing power. They they have transparency. You know what? You know how much currency is in circulation. You know if they're printing more money or if they're are trying to shrink the amount of, of currency that's out there. With crypto, you really have no idea. I don't know if someone uh, somewhere in their mother's basement has a computer algorithm and they're just figuring out how to manufacture more uh, cryptocurrency. You just, it's all, the beauty of cryptocurrency is it's, it's, uh, it's uh, anonymous. And then you have, because of the, the blockchain, you have a pretty good ledger of who has what. You don't may not know who they are, but there's a ledger out there in theory. And again, I don't. I'm not an expert on this, so I could be way off. But but you don't really know what it's worth. Like I was just looking today, what uh, Bitcoin's worth twenty two thousand five hundred and twenty eight dollars. Uh, I don't know. I, I have no basis to understand what that's worth. But there's certainly a lot of people that think it's has significant value. And there's been obviously some big hits as a result of what happened with FTX. And, uh, and I think the whole thing will be interesting. I mean, you know, it, it could completely unwind. So let's use this as a jumping off point in terms of talking about the economy in the United States. And again, whatever happens in the United States, I believe affects the rest of the world in a dramatic way. Um, Let's use this crypto FTX implosion to talk about what's happening in our own country. Uh, there are three data points I'd like to share with people right now and then have you talk about them. One is that we as the government of the United States, we the people of the United States, we passed a very significant number in terms of our debt, our accumulated debt as of this particular fiscal year, 2023, exceeds just over 31 
trillion dollars, which again is a number that is beyond human comprehension. The reason I mention is because when Mr. Bush took office in 2001, our accumulated debt was 3.4 trillion. It is literally increased almost tenfold, more than tenfold. Uh, that's one data point. The second data point is that we are now in an inflationary environment, somewhere between 6.3% and 6.7% officially, unofficially it's probably higher, but officially, which runs somewhat close to three times the average inflation rate over the past 25, 30 years. The third data point, which is actually the most scary, is that to service the debt of $31 trillion and increasing costs 15%. 15% of all federal spending goes to pay to service the debt called of $31 trillion. And I'm going to give one final interest because it's I want to talk about the human condition. In the United States of America, we have plus minus 300 million people, right? The debt is so large that you, we, the government could give $94,000 to every single citizen in the United States of America. That's how big our debt is right now. $31 trillion is literally giving every single American citizen $94,000, which is not chump change anymore. So the numbers are staggering. Well, they're, not, they're not giving it. Basically, those citizens have to pay for it. Ah, that's the other. So I just want to see. I wanted Peter to say that because he he got it right away. The reality is, it's not just they could government could give it. That's how much we owe each citizen, whether you're one month old or you're eighty nine or ninety eight, owes ninety four thousand dollars. Now, will it ever be collected? Unlikely, but that's not the point. The point is, what does that do? Peter, what does that do to an economy? What? How do you navigate that as a business person? Well, that's a good question. You know, there's there's basically been uh, the last several years a, a free ride. The government could uh, basically print deficits uh, and finance it by issuing more debt at relatively low cost where interest rates are approaching zero. Now that we have, uh, you know, short-term rates uh, are, are, you know, sort of approaching 5%, as you pointed out, the cost of that debt is going to take more and more of the budget. And what you have to do is you either have to do one of three things. You either have to raise taxes, you either have to cut spending, or you have to figure out how to inflate your way out of it, which is uh, in many respects, the most dangerous. And that will be a debate to come, you know? And, and, and what happens for most people is the numbers are so large, you know, it's almost difficult to comprehend. Uh, and, and they don't think about it in their day-to-day in -day life. What, what we're seeing is, is um, you know, a, a few things. One is, uh, I would say that yeah, I believe what what's happening with interest rates is taming inflation. And, you know, in the, in the past week, I've had a chance to talk to our companies. You know, we have a, a, a companies in the food service industry. We have companies in the retail industry. We have companies in the manufacturing industry. And each company is telling me that they're really not seeing price inflation right now, uh, that that prices have stabilized and in some instances prices have gone down. If, if you remember a year ago, we had a, a logistics crisis, right? Where, where uh, shipping costs for a container from let's say China or Taiwan uh, went from $3,000 a container up to $20,000 a container. And that's one of the reasons we saw, you know, shortage of goods, a lot of very rapid price inflation a year ago. Um, that's all calmed down considerably. Shipping costs have, have, have declined considerably. Um, they may not be down to $3,000 a container, but 
but you know maybe five thousand dollars a container but it's it's significantly down from twenty thousand dollars but you know what we what we have is I think inflation is is it, 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 the latest inflation number was six and a half percent. I I looked it up while you're speaking, uh, Barry. I think that is uh, uh, going to go down significantly. I, I don't think we're going to see price increases. Yeah, you get like eggs or something like that go you know go crazy, but those are not those aren't for overall economic reasons. Those are specific to that particular product. Um, but you know, I think inflation will will uh, will moderate considerably, and uh, I think the the big thing people are worried about are corporate earnings. And I think corporate earnings are going to be a challenge. Not every company, but you know, you've had you've had cost inflation. I think the consumer, you know, retail sales fell in the fourth quarter by one percent overall in the U.S., and that that feels about right. It sort of it was. A flat to slightly down fourth quarter, uh, which is a big quarter for retailers, with with uh, you know Christmas and the holiday period, um, and so I think it's going to be. I think we're going to have sort of a generally meandering economy this year. Uh, interest rates do crowd out investment, right? The more you have to pay to uh, put on. To expand your business, to buy another business, uh, the lower you're going to be able to grow, you know at that. And so, and then look at look at you know important parts of the economy. Real estate being one of the largest parts of the economy, uh, the cost of buying a home is up significantly, and that has to translate in price, because when someone goes to buy a house, you know they most people. Uh, get you know a pretty significant mortgage, and they base the price that they can pay for a house based on their monthly payment. And as rates go up, so do does that monthly payment, and that has to translate into lower values for real estate. So I think I think we still have downward exposure on real estate. I think the market is kind of seesawing back and forth on the value of companies, and I think that. Um, given earnings and given the cost of capital, I think that, you know, I don't see any reason why the market should. And given that, given it, in my opinion, we're going to have sort of a, you know, sluggish economy at, at best and maybe a recession at worst. Uh, you know, I've been pretty pessimistic, as Barry knows, for, you know, over a year now about what was going to happen. Um, I am glad to see that inflation's coming down, but it's going to be a real slog. And this this whole debt issue that you brought up, you're a hundred percent correct. And I don't see the political will to address it. That's a kick the can down the road thing for politicians. So that's I think the rub. Let's use that as a <clears throat> a point of contention, not between us, but to bring out the the situation. You use the great term. Uh, you see, these are your words, inflation going down, in quotation marks, considerably. Uh, let's say now that inflation is 6.5%. Without putting you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, are we talking, when you say considerably, that inflation will go below 4% this coming year? I have no idea, but yes, I think it will. So if inflation goes below 4% this year, and interest rates are, let's call it 5% or even low. Let's call it par. Interest rates at 4% and inflation at 4%. That could be beneficial to the economy, highly beneficial, correct? Inflation coming down would be beneficial. You know, interest rates are, higher interest rates are not beneficial. And you know, if if you look at a lot of what's happened over the last several years, it has been fueled by debt, right? Not only has the government been borrowing, but companies have been borrowing, people have been borrowing, and uh, as the cost of that borrowing goes up, there's just less capital available. And you know, you look at you look at the bellwether, what's going on in the tech sector, where you see. Uh, 
you know, companies announcing significant layoffs um, and, uh, and they're going to cut out the you know, tech companies cutting out the free, you know, all the perks, the free meals. They're making people come to the office. I think we're in the middle of a, of a change. And I think it's it's you know, it's it's basically a precursor to a recession. So on that R word, we're going to take a quick break because we do have sponsors that love us. And we urge everybody to uh, patronize our sponsors. We'll be right back with more Nolan in the economy. It's called Note. And uh, buckle up because there's some great stuff coming. I can feel it. And we'll be right back after this brief message. Do not go away. Imagine the kind of place you would want to shop for your favorite fur baby pet. Honest pets.co. Well, you found it. Honestpets.co. Not .com, .co. This is your go-to spot for the best, the cleanest pet treats that exist anywhere on the planet. All of the brands go through a rigorous review to make sure they meet the high standards of cleanliness, health benefits, and naturalness. This site was started by a husband and wife team and it's veteran-owned and that care about pets, especially dogs and cats, and coming soon, bird treats. These are very nice young people who really care about making a difference because a portion of proceeds go to support veteran organizations with a focus on service dogs. This is the place where you want to go, you want to tell your friends, this has the finest, yummiest, freshest, all-natural treats and stuff for your fur baby. So go there, honestpets.co honestpets.co. Do it now. Opportunity. What an opportunity. I'm going to use two four-letter words right now. Free gift. Free gift. Yes, you can have a copy of my best-selling book, The Joy of Living, How to Slay Stress and Be Happy, the ebook version for absolutely free. All you have to do is send an email to me, Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, at barryshore.com. And in the heading, the subject line, just write, free gift. (laughs) It's as easy as that. This is a life-changing, life-enhancing opportunity. Barry at barryshore.com. You'll be glad you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Free gift, do it now. Take the action, make it happen right now. Best wishes, bye. Good day, beautiful, bountiful, beloved immortal beings and good-looking people. Maybe you're good-looking because you're always looking for and finding the good. We found good in abundance. His name is Peter Nolan, and he joins us a few times a year to speak about the economy, the real issue of the economy, because he's a man who puts his own money. He's made done, thank God, he's done very well, but he puts his money into businesses. He has a portfolio of companies and he has investors that he is careful about their money. You don't want to make sure, you don't want to lose those people's money because they're tough people. And um, he wants to do well and on the economy and he wants you to do well. And that's why we're talking right now about, we've discussed inflation. We've talked about, in his opinion, inflation is going to be moderated greatly over the next uh, couple of quarters, maybe three quarters, and come down. Um, we're using 4% as a, a point, as an idea. But having interest rates of 4%, as he says, is still too high. You want interest rates, I think, somewhere around 2% or less. That would be probably a good place to be. But let's go with what you just talked about tech, because that's why I wanted to talk about that. It's um, To me, it's a bit dire. I read, I'm read. i a dedicated Wall Street Journal reader for decades. And when you have expansion in the marketplace, which is what we had, like you said, where everybody was doing thought they were doing well over the past few years. Tech especially expanded greatly. Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google, Netflix, everybody expanded with tens of thousands of jobs each. And now in contraction, which is what's happening, companies recognize, well, if we're going to be able to really get through what potentially is the R word, the recession, even if it's a mild one, you know, mild recession is a sort of an oxymoron, isn't it? Uh, we're going to lay off people. So you have 10,000 people being laid off from Microsoft. You have 15,000 people being laid off from Google, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the difficult part, Peter. 
as I read, and I'm talking to people who I know are getting laid off in, in high-level positions, they're not finding new jobs right away. People thought, well, you know, everybody can, there's a job every, uh, we need people, we need people. Well, yes, but no. People are not finding jobs. And I'm not talking about, gee, a week went by. We're talking about months. There's a great article in the Wall Street Journal just today about people not finding jobs for four months, five months. In other words, uh, what do they call the, not welfare, but unemployment run out and people don't have jobs. Now, if you have a mortgage and you have a car, and et cetera, et cetera, you live like a normal human being, that's tough because that's tens of thousands of high wage jobs that are not going to be easily replaced. So what do we do about that? That seems to be a huge weighing on the economy that is not, not productive, highly inefficient, and contributes to social unrest, in my humble opinion. <laughs> I have no idea what you do. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love to make you Peter laugh. That was great. <laughs> uh, you know what? 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 What do you do about it? You know, I, I think you do everything possible to um, not discourage companies from growing. And you know, most of most of what the most of what uh, the government actors do is is discourage growth. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, regulations, uh, um, you know, I live in the great state of California and we supposedly have a housing crisis, but it's probably the one of the most difficult places in the country to get a permit to actually build a house, you know. So so uh, I think you have to really look at stuff. I think what the political response, the knee jerk political response is going to be to increase unemployment benefits to to create, you know, more of a cushion, but that actually discourages people from working. And it's kind of a, what do you do? Because, you know, the political class always gravitates towards the simple answer and the right answer, like addressing, as you pointed out, the uh, almost tenfold increase in, in the country's debt uh, in the past couple of decades. Um, you know, you, you, there's really no big reward for taking the, the pain up front. Uh, it doesn't get you elected. And that's one of the challenges with our political system. So, you know, is there a courage out there to do the right thing? Probably not. And so we'll muddle through. Um, the economy generally muddles through and corrects. Um, you know, it, there's been <clears throat> the last two years plus, there's been an acute shortage of workers. Uh, and part of the reason there's acute shortage of workers is, is during COVID, people were paid not to work. And the more you pay someone not to work, the less workers there is available to fill the slots. And, um, and, but I see, the, I see that correcting unless there's some sort of big program that, that uh, subsidizes people to, to not work and stay at home. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, everyone's ready to go back to work everything in the U.S. is open. If you see what happened in China, China had very strict lockdowns as a result of COVID policy. And they finally just, you know, some one person described it, ripped the Band-Aid off and said, okay, everything's open. And, you know, supposedly a lot of people are, are dying from COVID. I, I don't know. You know, you always worry about the, uh, the accuracy of information you get from someplace like China. Um, but, you know, uh, I think that we're just going to have to work through it. And then that's why I think it'll be a muddle through economy this year. And that, 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 that's absent something happening that none of us expected, right? You know, COVID was something that none of us expected. Ukraine was something that really no one expected. It's, it's, it's very difficult. And one thing that I've, I've seen over the course of my lifetime is any given year, there's going to be events that you just never anticipated happening. Um, so we'll see, but, you know, I, my, my advice is to be cautious. Uh, I wouldn't for, for, uh, you know, most people, I, I wouldn't be taking on a lot of debt. I'd try to pay down my debt as much as I could. It's funny. I, I needed a, I needed a printer for my office and I, I looked at the contract, uh, to lease it and it was, it was 11% interest charge. And so I said, well, I'm not going to 
I'm not going to 11%. I'm not going to lease it. I'm going to just right. buy it uh, because I don't want to be out borrowing money from the printer company to put a new printer in my office at 11%. And so I think a lot of people are going to have to make those decisions. And what's going to happen is people will then forego. They may not need the new furniture in their house, or the new TV or the new car. Um, you know, we went through a period because of the supply chain issues and COVID and everything else where, you know, it's difficult to get a new car. That will correct. I mean, you know, the economy, people will make cars and they'll make TVs and they'll make couches. And, and whether the consumer will buy them or not, I think it'll be more of a challenge just because of interest rates. So let's talk about interest rates for the moment vis-a-vis -vis the where interest rates touch the human being. And that is looking at a contract for a printer for at 11%. Well, the most debt that people carry outside of their home is credit cards. And credit cards, if you have 11% on your credit card, that's a cheap one. You know, yeah. most credit cards are in the 20% range. So if anybody ever asks me, I say, hello, first thing you do is spend, the, not spend, invest an extra dollar to pay down credit card debt as much as you can. That is where you can really save a lot and really do yourself a big favor. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, pay down your highest rate debt first. And, you know, the, the home is obviously that for anyone that owns a home, that's usually their biggest uh, payment. But uh, credit cards have a lot of discretionary payments on them. And, and you should just try not to keep as little credit card uh, borrowing balance as possible. Hopefully not. Uh, you know, that's, not that's not realistic. You know, that's not how people live. People, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the economy lives paycheck to paycheck and, and they rely on uh, uh, things like credit cards to, to basically help them make ends meet. It'll be well, a challenge. Let's talk about the R word that you mentioned, uh, let's say you said the great state of California or the once great state of California um, and regulations. And it's not just California, but regulations seem to be increasing over the years. You know, the ability, let's say, again, you have a portfolio of companies in different sectors. The, you know, the regulations, let's say, in Oregon or in Idaho may be very different than they are in New York State or in California or in Texas. And navigating those regulations, that's that's a big job if you're running businesses, isn't it? It is. It is. You know, navigating that, navigating litigation. Uh, you know, Oh, very good. The L word. There's a whole part of the economy that it's an industry, uh, you know, basically um, litigating against uh, companies for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a, it's a tax on businesses. Um, you know, if, if you look at, um, look, there's been, I think this has been fueled by movies and, and politicians, but there's a popular perception out there with people that aren't really that involved in business that all business is evil. And that businesses and corporations are uh, able to extract uh, excess uh, excess profits from people unfairly. Um, and you know, one of the things that when I talk to students and people that aren't involved in business, I tell them you just don't realize how difficult any business is. It may look easy when when you see a CEO flying around on his private jet with his new wife. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. That was a very a snide, but it, it's very. No, but, but, but it may look it may look easy, but it's not. Like, and, no, and, hello. And, uh, and and you know, I think that <clears throat> I think that we've done a disservice, especially to young people. That that sort of it, it's almost it's almost like a you know Santa Claus mentality that because a business exists. It makes too much money, and therefore we need to try to take that money from that business and spread it out to the population, uh, because because the businesses all have excess profits. And the truth is, is that um, one of the things I, I've <clears throat> learned over the course of my career is just how hard, as a business owner, how hard any business is. 
if you look at it, all the external factors that come to play on a business, you know, you have you have competitors, you have the government, you have you have the markets, you have, uh, uh, you know, labor issues that can occur. You have litigation that can occur. There's just it, it, it's just there's so many factors. And for some people that run companies, it becomes overwhelming. Um, and and even large, successful companies, no one really has a monopoly. You know, so there's there's someone waking up in any business. There's someone waking up every morning trying to basically take your market away from you. Right. And and so you just can't you can't uh, you can't be still. You 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 know, I, it's probably a, a bad analogy, but I said to someone, you know, businesses are like sharks. They have to be moving or, or they perish. Mm -hmm. And um, then they go, oh, well, businesses are sharks. And, I'm, you know, it's, it's probably not a good analogy because it sort of reinforces a, a negative image. But the truth is, is it is that business is extremely hard and extremely competitive and extremely challenging. And there's just so many risk factors that come into play. And and I think that, um, you know, getting back to uh, what's going on is that if you look at the government, and what the government does is that the government discourages business in general. And then all of a sudden they say, well, uh, the economy's bad in this area. So we're going to have to basically give money to a business to, to get the business to do something. <laughs> and, and usually that's someone that's politically connected that shouldn't be there in the first place. And, and those things, there's really no history of those working all that well. Um, I'm sure I'm sure there's exceptions, but generally those things don't work all that well. Um, and and that's just not the right way to do it. It's it's you really need to let the garden grow. You need to let businesses go out and and prosper and and not think that uh, uh, engaging in an activity of commerce to try to generate a profit is a bad thing. On, on the contrary, and let's use that as a springboard. In my humble opinion, it is the most noble, I'm using these words carefully, it is the most noble of endeavors, number one. The United States of America is one of the few places on earth that one can do this, which is to start a business. Um, there's a, a wonderful fellow that I am enamored of, Bernie Marcus. Everybody, yeah. if you don't know him, you, you need to know. You know what he and his partner built, Home Depot. And he is out on the stump these days, uh, I would say bemoaning, bemoaning the fact that it would be almost impossible for he and his partner to do today what they did 40 years ago with Home Depot because of the R word, regulation, because of the L word, litigation, because of the E word, the employee issues that are coming up and, and, and making business so much more difficult because it is it, it if you look at it for all the things you just said peter you wonder how can anybody succeed right and yet thank god there are entrepreneurs like yourself who are not just undaunted but foolish enough i use it in the most beautiful way i call it foolish spelled f u e l i s h foolish in other words you you're you're literally driven to build. In other words, that, that is the mentality that exists in America. We are a capitalist society, and we should not in any way uh, be apologetic for it because it's the engine that runs the world. Just as another little wonderful situation about uh, debt is so funny. Our debt, it's horrible to say this, $31 trillion is equal to the G. GDP of China, Japan, and Germany, the three other largest economies in the world, combined. But right. the engine, the engine that runs everything is the United States of America. <laughs> there's, there's no other place where you can do this. Am I correct? In the same way. No, not in the same way. You know, it, it's 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 a challenge. You know, probably probably you know economically some of the most free countries. And I I've not done anything there, so I don't really know for sure. Some of the eastern eastern European countries, but but aside from them, and those are those are teeny tiny economies. 
you're right. The United States, the United States is one of the few places, but you know, we we're moving more towards a European model and uh, the European model comes with higher governmental spending, higher social costs, more restrictions, uh, more extraneous factors that come into play. And it, it makes it more and more difficult. What we've had over the last several years, which has counterbalanced a lot of this, is capital, capital money was available, risk money was available for a wide variety of purposes, both equity and debt. In other words, you could borrow pretty easily at very attractive rates to do something with your business or to buy a business, and equity was available. Um, you know. Less so from the public markets, but more so from from private sources, private equity, venture capital, et cetera. And so you had this tremendous liquidity fueling an investment boom. And what I think we'll see is a contraction of that. And, you know, there's a little bit like it's a little bit like uh, uh, you could buy a business and let's say it cost you all in 5% to 6% even a little over a year ago. And today it may cost you 11%, 12%. And that's like that's like you're sort of in the ring and you're taking one right to the head. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of, you're staggering because you're like, wow, what, what do I do? And that's, that's why, you know, you see places like Goldman Sachs announced they laid off 3,000 people, uh, I think, last week. Uh, you know, that, that's the fighter is staggering. Uh, and, and as a result, there's just not a lot of transactions that are taking place because either, either you know, either nothing happens or the prices for businesses, the value for businesses has to adjust. And that's why I'm, a, I'm not that optimistic about the market. I'm going to read to you, we only have a couple more minutes, but I, I found it so Powerful and almost disturbing. Uh, again, if you're watching this, you can watch Peter's face as I read the article or the headline in the Wall Street Journal. Today, today, this is what, January 24th, 2023. And the, the headline reads, hopes for a market's recovery hinge on big drop in inflation. So the reason I find it, I cringe when I read this is because it starts with the word hopes and it recovery hinge on a big drop in inflation. Now, Peter already told us that inflation is going to drop. So that's great, considerably said. But as you know, Peter, better than anybody, hope is not a strategy for business. Right? right. <laughs> right? I think you, you have to, you know, you have to plan to be conservative. And if you're wrong, you miss some opportunity, but it's a lot better than uh, uh, basically overexpanding your business and, and then all of a sudden seeing seeing the customers fall away and, and then you're in a lot of trouble or you take on a lot of debt. Um, you know, I, I have a I have a company that we, we uh, own that uh, had a line of disinfecting products. Right. And what what happened during COVID is obviously that exploded. Right. You, you, you just you just you could sell them at any price. You could sell as much as you could manufacture. It's like face masks. Today, you can't give it away, right? So uh, the companies that thought that the you know trees were going to go to the moon, uh, that invested heavily in, in basically disinfecting products in 2020, um, they're in serious trouble. And, and we're seeing it. You know, A lot of them are liquidating as a result of overexpanding. Uh, I think we, we, we got caught in that a little bit, but, but we've been much more careful and our business is doing fine. We actually had a record year in revenues this past year. So, um, you know, I think I think you're right. I think uh, um, hope isn't a strategy, and and I think people are going to be cautious. And caution means less employees, less spending, less expansion, uh, and so it's going to be kind of a muddling year. Uh, and then throw into it some something, you know, weird happening that sitting here in January of 2023, we just didn't expect. That always happens, right? It's it's always, right. <laughs> it's it's always the, there's always things that happen that you don't expect. That's part of life. And uh, 
you know, people, uh, people in my business, uh, you know, in the financial world are always like, you know, well, that was a weird one. It's always a weird one. There's always something that you don't expect is going to happen. And, and, you know, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's uh, nature, whether the economy, who knows, but, but uh, I'm, I'm very cautious right now. Well, on that wonderful high note, that's a high C <laughs> with a capital C. High C, cautious, muddling. But um, I'm going to ask you three quick questions. Number one, and I know, I hope I know the answer to this one. Peter, will you come back again? Only for you, Barry. Wow, thank you. And um, you have 80 seconds, kid, to answer this. And you, you give it every time, and I you hope you do it this time as well. What's your most fervent desire? It's the same thing I always tell you every time, health and happiness of my children and, uh, I guess, peace in the world. Uh, and, and, you know, I hope, uh, I hope uh, people can learn uh, better to coexist. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Now, I do always give you a hug, even though you're shy about it, but we're going to do a hug in front of all these people. Remember, go to my website, barryshore.com, and share this with five people because we want to touch million plus people. These are very important, interesting, useful ideas that Peter's been sharing with us. And we thank you very much. So, big hug, heartfelt, unlimited giving. One, two, three. <laughs> Make it a great one, Peter. Thank you so right, much. Barry. I we'll appreciate see you, brother. It. Take care. Bye now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Joy of Living Podcast. Now that's another step towards your healthier, happier, and wealthier life. Never hesitate to do good in the world, no matter what the situation. Join us for another upbeat discussion next time at BarryShore.com. And be sure to leave a rating and subscribe to the show to get more conversations like this. And remember to share it with your family and friends too. See you on the next episode.